of Jesus love that taught me when I was lost in sin of wondrous grace that brought me back to his fold again of heights and depths of mercy far deeper than the sea and higher than the heavens my theme shall ever be sweeter as the years go by sweeter as the years go by richer fuller deeper Jesus' love grows sweeter, sweeter as the years go by. He trod in old Judea, life's pathway long ago. The people thronged about him, his saving grace to know. He healed the brokenhearted and caused the blind to see and still his great heart yearneth in love for even me. Sweeter as the years go by Sweeter as the years go by, richer, fuller, deeper, Jesus' love is sweeter, sweeter as the years go by. Was wondrous love which led him for us to suffer loss, to bear without a murmur the anguish of the cross. With saints redeemed in glory, let us our voices raise. Tell heaven and earth re-echo with our Redeemer's praise. Sweeter as the years go by, sweeter as the years go by, richer, fuller, deeper, Jesus' love grows sweeter sweeter as the years go by. Sing, don't you? It's a blessing. Matthew chapter 6, if you would, while the children are being dismissed this morning. Matthew chapter 6. Now, I know that it is a difficult thing to preach before a meal. And it's also hard to listen before a meal, isn't it? So ignore the wonderful smells wafting over. I've asked them to try to keep the door shut as much as possible so we can focus on this. But uh, I promise you that uh, this will not go longer than an hour and a half, hour 45 tops here, this message, all right? If you listen well. Matthew chapter 6. Uh, when we talk about prayer, and when you come to church and you hear a, a message or uh, see, by the way, it was wrong in the bulletin today. It still has last week's message in it. Today we're preaching on prayer. And as we, uh, when you hear that kind of discussed, there's really a, a temptation almost to kind of tune out. Uh, because when it comes to prayer, we often find ourselves in a comfort zone. I think if you were to ask the typical Christian, are you happy with your prayer life? Yeah, I think I am. Uh, there's a kind of, we kind of treat prayer like a kid does Santa Claus. You know, once every so often we present a wish list of things that we want and we go with our requests. We used to bathe once a week and pray every day. Now we bathe every day and pray once a week if we're lucky and, and it's vice versa there. Uh, prayer is a subject that we're going to address and do address repeatedly from this pulpit because it's the most powerful weapon 
in a Christian's arsenal, yet it is the least one reached for and used. We don't have, somehow we don't believe or we don't utilize it enough. Today I ask you to please don't tune me out. You're going to hear some tools I think that will be a help to you that if you feel frustrated in your prayer life or you don't know how uh, to, to reach the horns of heaven and, and get, get, uh, you know, get, get God to work in your life, I ask you to listen today and I think it will be a help to you. I read this week that they now have a dial of prayer for atheists. You know what a dial of prayer is, right? You call in and you give your prayer request. Well, they have one for atheists as well. And uh, you call, you call up this number, and it rings, and rings, and rings, and nobody answers. But praise God, when you pray, somebody's on the other end. Amen? That's what I want to talk about today. Let's read Matthew 6, verse number 9. The Bible says, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to preach today on pray like you mean it. Pray like you mean it. Father, I pray you'd help us now as we look into this subject of prayer and the example that Jesus gave. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> it's most commonly called the Lord's Prayer. It's not really the Lord's Prayer. He asks for forgiveness in it, and the Lord doesn't need to ask for forgiveness. I like to call it the model prayer or the disciples' prayer. Uh, in response to their request to learn to pray, uh, he gives them this model prayer. He does not say, pray these words. He says, after this manner, pray you. I do not believe that the purpose of this prayer is to re repetition it every night before bed. You say this prayer. I don't think that's the point of it. The point of Jesus is trying to show us is that it's a model for us to pray after this manner, he says. When we pray, you can, if you break down this prayer, you'll notice that within it we should accept the Father's person, his purpose, his provision, his pardon, his pathway, his protection, his power, and his permanence. All of these are found within this Lord's Prayer here. Now, no believer's spiritual life, this means you and it means me, no believer's spiritual life will rise above their prayer life. That can, can be a scary thought for us. Prayer fortifies you from temptation. Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Temptation is a battle that we fight every day. And how do we fight it? We fight it with prayer. We fight it with tapping into the throne of God. There are a number of lessons that we can learn from this passage. And it's not, I, I again mention, I don't believe this is a prayer meant to be repetitious. I don't believe that it's meant to be read over and over uh, in a mantra type. It is a manner, it is a type, it's a pattern for us to pray. And so let's break it down today and we'll see what we can learn from it. He begins with the words, Our Father. Our Father is a recognition of relationship. This is between the one praying and the one being prayed to God. This, those who pray do so in the father-child relationship. We need not for, to forget that when we pray. Isn't there something about being related that makes all the difference in the world? When you're related, you're able to come boldly and talk to that person. I have nothing, but my dad has everything. My father has it all. In Mark chapter 14, verse 36, Jesus addresses God, the Father, in a unique way. He says, Abba, Father. This is what the Bible says. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me, nevertheless, what I, not what I will, but what thou will. Jesus used two wo words here for God. He calls him Abba, Father. Now, the word Abba is an interesting one. It's an Aramaic word. It only appears three times in your Bible. It's kind of the equivalent of our word for daddy, a little bit more tender, a closer relationship. It expresses a deep emotional devotion that Jesus had with God the Father. The word father comes from the Greek word pater. It is a, 
It's a word for the, an adult son. Jesus entered here fully into the mind and will of God. So he came to the Father with every confidence. Abba, Father. Now you read that and you say, yeah, but that was Jesus. Wait a minute. Let me take you to Romans chapter 8, verse 15. A great verse here. And in fact, this is such an exciting verse, it would make an Episcopalian say amen if he reads this verse. Read it with me. Romans 8, 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. Hey, listen now. Where we cry, what? Abba, Father. You know what the Bible tells us there? Just as Jesus Christ had a relationship with God the Father, you too can have that same relationship as a son and a daughter. He has brought you into the family. You are one of His. Now you too can cry out, Abba, Daddy, Abba, Father. Yet how sad, many Christians do not approach Him like this. How would you feel if your child, however old your child is a uh, a growing child, though, 9, 10 years old, mom and dad, you're sitting there, and, and they walk up tomorrow and they say this, Father, Mother, I thank thee for the gift of life thou hast bestowed upon me, and now I ask that you may give me the provision for the day that I may lift up your name in exaltation. And now, listen, I'm not trying to belittle being respectful to God, but that's not a relationship, that's formalism. We have a relationship with God. He's our Father. He's our dad. Uh, we need to, of course, fear and honor him, but like a father. Now, parenthood, if most of us are familiar with parenthood, most of us are parents in here, uh, somebody said parenthood is like a blender, like having a blender that's always on and it has no top. Can anybody identify with that? That's parenthood. Uh, I know that some days parenting feels like hostage negotiation with a band of drunken bipolar pirates. That's what sometimes parenthood feels. But we still do it. Why do we do it? Because we love them. We love our children. I love my children. I'd do anything for my kids. Yet I'm evil. The Bible says in Matthew 7, 11, Jesus said, If ye then being evil can know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father in heaven give good things to them that ask Him? The first thing we do when we pray we recognize our relationship. Jesus began his prayer with our Father. Aren't you glad that today when you pray to the Lord, you're not praying to some distant deity. You're praying, friend, to your Father. He says, Our Father, I come to you as family. Well, by the way, in this prayer, we haven't asked for anything yet up to this point. Okay, we're, gonna, we're just honoring the Lord. Recognize your relationship. Then he says, Which art in heaven. This is a recognition of his sovereignship. We're praying to the one who created and controls and rules everything. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 through 17. The Bible says, For by him were all things created, things that are in heaven, that are in earth, uh, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things and by him all things consist. We're praying to the one who has absolute all power. It's the same thing that we can have as we had when we were schoolboys in the schoolyard. Remember when you were, uh, if you were a man in here, at some time probably you made a statement like, my dad can what? Beat up your dad. I never said that. My dad had polio. And uh, he never... Uh, he wasn't strong, and so I never made that uh, claim to other kids. Uh, but as my dad many times said, it's better to be disabled from the neck down than it is to be disabled from the neck up. And I do totally agree with him there. But when it comes to my God, my Father is the strongest. He can beat up any problem that comes into my life. Hey, circumstantial bully, my Father can whip up all over you. Amen? We can say that. We understand that He's in control. No difficulty is greater than my Father. He is never flabbergasted. He is never uh, confused or worried. He is all-powerful. Hebrews 1.3, Who being in the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power. That's amazing, isn't it? God is in control. 
He is set down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Who keeps all of this going? Who's in control of all that's going on in the world today? My Father's in control. The one I pray to. Our Father, which art in heaven. Even the devil in the Bible we see is often nothing more than God's errand boy. In 2 Corinthians 12, interesting story, Satan thought he would put a stop to the Apostle Paul. Paul's always around given the Gospels, leading all these people to Christ. People are getting saved. Even uh, leaders of Jewish community are getting saved. And so Satan wants to put a stop to it. And this is Paul's testimony. He says, lest I should be exalted above measure <clears throat> in the abundance of revelations, there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Now the word buffet comes from a word that means to strike with a fist. So Satan thought, I'm going to send something into Paul's life that's going to bloody his nose. I'm going to send something in his life that's going to make him stop. I'm going to, uh, he, I want to distract him from God's work. I want to shut him up. What happened with that? Well, he did send that into Paul's life, and this is what Paul said that God did. Verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 12, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul goes on and says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What was meant to be a punch in the nose by Satan turned out to be the conduit of God's power into uh, Paul's life. Hey, God's in control. Amen? Don't ever doubt the fact that God is in control of your circumstances. God's in control of your sicknesses. God's in control of all that comes into your life. Trust Him. Our Father, the Bible says, that's our relationship, which art in heaven. That's his sovereignship, his sovereignty. And then uh, and at this point in the prayer, by the way, just so you notice, we haven't asked for anything yet. Right? We're just glorifying the Father. He goes on, he says, hallowed be thy name. Our Father's relationship, which art in heaven, is his sovereignty. And then recognition here of, his, of worship, hallowed be thy name. You're in his presence, don't forget this, for who He is, not for what He can do for you. Who is God, after all? Well, you could spend all day and all night talking about that, but let's just use the ABCs to give you a few of them here. He is A, the Alpha and Omega. He is the Benevolent One. He is the Creator. He's the Dwelling Place. He's Eternal, Everlasting God. He's the Forgiving Father. He's the Great I Am. He's the Healer, the Holy One. He's the immortal. He's the Jehovah Jireh, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the mighty one. He's the name above all names. He's the omnipotent, om omnipresent, and omniscient one. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the quickening spirit. He's my refuge. He's my strong tower. He is truth. He is unwavering. He is victorious. He is wise, wonderful, and worthy. He is exalted, and I know exalted begins with an E. It's the best I can do, amen? I was homeschooled. He is exalted. He is Yahweh. He is zealous. This is the God that is your Father. That's the one you're going to. You see our Father, which art in heaven. About two months ago, I tried to, to get an audience with our great governor. And I was told very nicely by her scheduler, take a hike. All right, I, evidently they didn't know who I was or something like that. Friend, that's just our governor. This is the creator of the universe, and you don't need an appointment. Is that a blessing? Our Father, which art in heaven. When you come before him, take a moment. Take a moment before you start rattling off your wish list, and take a moment to recognize and acknowledge who he is. Hey, the front door and the back door of prayer is praise. Give him some. Notice again, we haven't asked him for anything yet. Give him what he wants before you worry about what you want. I have a daughter, Sarah. You know, we'll all know that she's not here, so I'm going to talk about her. Um, she was a master at this from a young age. She would come to me when she wanted something, and she would start to, we, we use the terminology, butter me up, okay? Talk about, Dad, I love you. You're the best. You know, my friend so-and-so, she talks about her relationship with her dad, and she just, she just doesn't have what we have, and I'm just so grateful for it, and I'm so lucky to have you. I wish every girl could have a dad like you. 
you make me want to be a better person. And on and on and on it went. At this point, my wallet's open, my checkbook's out. I'm holding the keys to my Jeep away uh, for her to take. You understand, I'd do anything for her. And by the way, here's the thing. She wasn't playing me. This, she really meant what she said. No, we're not talking about flattery here. We're talking about recognition. We're talking about uh, appreciation, genuine appreciation. Before you start asking for stuff, any relationship in which all you do is ask for things is a shallow relationship. Don't you think for a moment that God doesn't desire the same? Praise, adoration. The Bible says in Psalm 100, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All ye lands, serve the Lord with gladness. Here it is, come before his presence with singing. He wants praise. Verse 4 shows us, you might not have realized this, but did you know the gates to God's house has a password? Did you know that? There's a password to the gates of God's house. We find it in Psalm chapter 100, verse number 4. It says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. That's what you've got to type in there, thanksgiving. He wants us to come into his presence. He wants us, when we pray, to come with thanksgiving and to come with praise. Why do we begin our prayer with praise? Because when we praise God, it gets our perspective aligned to where it should be. It gets our eyes off of ourselves. It reminds us of who he is, who I'm speaking to, and it reminds us of who I am and what right I have to demand anything of him. Helps our perspective. We haven't asked him for anything yet. He's our father. That denotes our relationship. Which art in heaven, that's our sovereignty. Hallowed be thy name, he said. That's worship. And then he said, thy kingdom come. This is a recognition of ownership. As the creator of all things, God holds the certificate of ownership. Of the world and everything within it. Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it on the seas and established it upon the floods until you transfer all that you have to his ownership, friend, you're in charge. And I have a secret for you. You don't want to be in charge. You don't. Complete control of your own life is just as possible as taking a picture of a unicorn. Maintaining control is as easy as catching the wind. Now, even though you know that unicorns aren't real and nobody can catch the wind, we still strive for control. We still try to hold on to it. And this is only going to lead to frustration in your Christian life. Proverbs 19.21 There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, it shall stand. The best thing that you can do, my friend, is just to give God ownership willingly. He can take it any time He pleases anyway. Just give it to Him. I love my family. But it's not my family. It's God's family. Did you know He could take any one of them any time He pleased? I'm not in control. He's in control. I love, I think you know, I love and adore Bible Baptist Church. It's my favorite place on earth, right in here. I love it. I love Bible Baptist. I love the people within it. But it's God's church. It's not my church. It's God's church. By the way, I'm glad you people are God's people. It wasn't hard for me to transfer that ownership to him. Amen? I'm just teasing. Okay, don't get upset with me. Not my kingdom. It's God's kingdom. It's not my car. It's God's car. And on down the line, it's not my wallet. It's God's wallet. Everything that I have, it has to be His. Can I tell you, friend, it's a better life when you put it in His hand. Don't forget, if you're a child of God, you are His. Not only your stuff, you. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which ye have of God? You're not your own, for you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They're not yours. It's not my body. It's God's body. So what I do with this body, better honor Him because He's the owner of it. You ever borrowed a car before? I don't like borrowing vehicles. Uh, you're afraid you want to do something. You don't want to scratch it. You don't want to make it dirty. You want to take as good care of it as you can. Why? Because it's not yours. So you want to take extra good care, amen? This isn't my body. 
I've got to take care of it for the Lord. I'm a steward of it. We are in the family of God. 1 Peter 1, 18, 19. Uh, For as much as ye know, ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Oh, friend, it was a great day when I bowed my head and accepted His payment for my sin. And when God accepted me into His family, where sin abounded, grace did abound more. And if you're a child of God, if you're saved today, you can rejoice in that too. Now here's the question that I have. We trust God with our eternal soul. Give Him your stuff already. How do we trust God with our eternal soul? But we don't trust Him with our finances. Oh, preacher, I can't tithe because I just wouldn't have enough to cover my bills. You don't think God knows? Trust Him. He owns it all. By the way, Every Christian tithes. Every Christian tithes. Some do it willingly. Every Christian tithes. Now, the great thing about God's ownership is the freedom that it brings. Because when God owns everything, He's responsible. We're just the managers. Our only job is to be good stewards of what He has given us. Jesus reminds us of that. Before I say that, I want to give an example. There's a preacher I was talking to about two years ago. He's saying that they had a, they had a leak in the roof of their church. And, and, uh, so I, and they didn't have the money to replace it. And so I said, what are you going to do? And he said, well, you know, I, I took it to the Lord, and his, his, this was his prayer. He said, God, your house has a leak in it. I, I never thought of, of it this way, but I thought this is a great way to do it. He said, Lord, your house has a leak in it. Now, Lord, I don't want to... I don't want to embarrass your name. It's not a good thing for people to see that God's house has a leak in it. We need, to, we need to get the leak fixed. And I trust you that we'll... And by the way, God did provide it in a great way and they got it fixed. But I thought, what a neat way of looking at it. It's God's house, not my house. It's God's body, it's not my body. It's God's family, it's not my family. Jesus reminds of this when He, uh, he, he reminds us that what we possess is only temporary. Matthew 6, 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there is your heart also. When we accept God's ownership of our things, He promises to take care of things. He follows it up, Jesus does with these words. He says, therefore I say unto you, take no thought of your life. Don't worry. Take no thought means not to worry. What you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Behold the fowls of the air. They sow not, neither do they reap, neither gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not more than those? What a great lesson. So listen, don't have to worry. You let God take care of those things. Giving God ownership is liberating. Uh, it, I don't have to hold tightly onto my stuff claiming that it's mine. I don't have to worry that I'll starve if I pay my tithe. I can trust God to be faithful as He always is. Instead of clutching, I can open my hands and say, God, it's all yours anyhow. Our Father talks about a relationship. Which art in heaven talks about His sovereignship. Hallowed be Thy name, that's worship. Thy kingdom come, that's ownership. By the way, I've heard people say, there's no way I can pray for ten minutes, a half hour. You start praying like this, you can. You start recognizing who He is. and start uh, rejoicing in who God is and your relationship. By the way, We haven't asked Him for anything yet. Number five. He says, Thy will be done. This is a recognition of His Lordship. We tend to pray, not, uh, we tend to pray our will, not God's will. A lady asked her friend, saw her coming in with a dozen donuts to work, and she asked her friend, I thought you were on a diet. What are you bringing in a dozen donuts for? She said, well, it's like this. As I, I come in and, and I come right by the donut store and as I was taking a turn toward the donut store this morning uh, where the shop was, I told God if He wanted me to get a dozen donuts to have a parking spot right out front in front of the door. And she says, wouldn't you know it, the eighth time around there was a parking spot right there by the front door. We tend to pray our will, not His will. William Barclay said, the world's most popular prayer is thy will be changed. The world's best prayer is thy will be done. 
we tend to pray, Thy will be changed. Jesus was obedient to God all the way to the cross. He said in Mark 14, 36, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me, nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Every day, friend, you should pray a declaration of you being dead to your will. Like Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Listen, friend, have you surrendered your will? Have you surrendered it? Do you have to get your way at the house? Are you upset when you don't get your way? You see, when it comes to prayer, we sometimes attempt to impose our will on God, and that's not what prayer is. Can I, I don't want to burst your bubble or disappoint you today, but God is not waiting in heaven to find out what your opinion is. He's just not. He's all-knowing. He's omniscient. He doesn't need our advice. No, prayer is a wonderful way for God to reveal His will to me. God's interest, God has no interest in hiding His will from you. We ought to find it. Genesis 18, 17, and the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? No. It's a rhetorical question. He would not. Psalm 37, 4, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. I put all my emotions and my passions and my longings and my aspirations, I put them in Him, and then God changes my heart to what He wants. Then when I get what I want, which was His will for me in the first place, See how that works? Where uh, our, He will give us the desires of our heart. Let me ask you today, friend, do you delight in anything above God? Does God take a back seat to anything else you have going on? There's a story about Martin Luther's puppy. He's eating at the table one day, and his puppy was there beside them on the floor on the ta- by the table, and he was watching trying to get a scrap. You've probably been there before if you've ever had a, a pooch in the house. They watch while you eat. And he's watching as Martin Luther is eating. He's watching with his mouth open, his eyes trained on the meat. It moves, his eyes move with it. He's watching. This is what Martin Luther said. Oh, if I could only pray the way this dog watches meat. All his thoughts are concentrated. Oh, he has no thought. No hope, no wish, but that meat. What if we prayed, friend, for the will of God like that? We desired it, we wanted it. I turn to Romans 8. I want to show you something very interesting in Scripture here. Romans 8, the Bible says in verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. This is Romans 8. 27, and he searches the heart, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So here, get the picture. You have, you're, you're praying to the best of your knowledge, but your knowledge is incomplete. The Bible says we, see, we sometimes don't know what to pray for, because we're, we don't know our future, we don't know what's best for us. We're imperfect, we're not always clear on the will of God. Then the Spirit maketh intercession for for us. He comes to God and makes requests according to His will. So then the Spirit comes back to you and makes known to you the will of God. Now you can ask God according to His will what He wanted for you in the first place. That's wonderful stuff, isn't it? All the Holy Spirit. Prayer like that is why the Bible says in John 14, 14, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, that's a loaded promise because we need to make sure that it's in His name. Are we praying according to the will of God? If the request is wrong, God says no. If the timing is wrong, God says slow. If you are wrong, God says grow. But if the timing is right, the request is right, and you are right, God says go. Hey, what if we really, really got into prayer? What if we really tried to pray like this prayer here? What would it do for our relationship? You know, there's nothing that makes us love one another like praying for one another. Uh, Pray for your nemesis. Pray for your enemies. That's why Jesus says pray for your enemies. Because he knows that once you start praying for them, a love will grow for them. 
uh, turn them into your loved one. By the way, we're into this prayer now. We still have not asked for anything. Our Father talks about our relationship, uh, which art in heaven. That's our so- the so- His sovereignty. Hallowed be thy name. That's a recognition of worship. Thy kingdom come. That's ownership. Thy will be done. That's the recognition of His lordship. And then he says, on earth as it is in heaven. That's recognizing His leadership. We ought to ask our God and we ought to seek to do whatever plan God has written for your life. Ephesians 2.10, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Did you know that God has a plan for you? He does, each and every one of you. He wants to use you and you and you and you and you, every single one of us. He wants to use us. He has a course all laid out specifically for you. He has a plan for you. In fact, Paul was talking to the leaders of the Ephesus church close to the beginning of his ministry, and this is what he said in Acts 20, 24. He says, but none of these things move me, neither count on my life dear unto myself, uh, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of Christ Jesus. So he says, hey, I recognize there's a course laid out for me. God has a plan for me. I have no other desire but to run that course that he has for me. And guess what? Paul did just that shortly before he died in 2 Timothy 4, 7. He says, I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Paul's prayer was that he might do the work that God sent him to do. How about you? Are you willing to pray recognizing God's leadership? He, we talked about his relationship, his sovereignship, his, our worship of him, his ownership, his lordship, his leadership. Now that's where we're going to end today. But the next line in the prayer is give us this day our daily bread. Now let me ask you here, friend, and just answer honestly, and let's think about it for a second. With the setup that we've just done, recognizing who God is, worshiping Him because of it, recognizing His leadership, lordship, and ownership in our lives, knowing who we are compared to Him, all that's involved in it, do you think for a minute that God will hesitate in meeting your need? I don't think so. I really don't. Not if we pray this way. It'll make an impact. The Bible says again in Matthew 7, 11, I read it earlier, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask Him? What if your child asked for something after going through these five prerequisites of recognition? We'd give them anything in our power. God will take care of you. You can trust Him. He has your best interest at heart. He is your Father. He's not some distant deity in the sky as all the Greek gods and and the uh, Roman gods always... uh, It was about appeasement. They were angry with people and they constantly had to sacrifice to try to gain their appeasement. You have a Father in Heaven who loves you and gave Himself for you. That's how you ought to pray. Relationship makes all the difference, doesn't it? Pray like you mean it. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed as a pianist comes forward. I have two questions for you today. Number one, are you a child? Friend, have you ever accepted Christ as your Savior personally? You ever made that decision? If you're here today and you've never personally accepted Christ as your Savior, listen, none of what I said applies to you. This is for God's children, but you can change that today. You can become a child of God just by accepting His gift of salvation. Oh, please listen, friend. Do not leave today before you make that decision. If you're in here today, nobody's looking around. I won't embarrass you. You'll say, preacher, that's me. I don't know for sure. If something happens...